following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. Break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. And co-hosts, Mike Tussaw from KnowYourOptionsInc.com and Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express. Don't spend time worrying about your broker. At Options Express, security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures, all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit optionsexpress.com slash OX radio to open your free account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, and that rocking tune means it's time yet again for the Option Block, your bi-weekly source for all things options-related. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as a little outlet we like to call the Options Insider Radio Network, upon which many of you, I'm sure, are listening to this fine program right now. And before we start off, I, of course, want to remind all of you to play along with us at home Visit theoptionsinsider.com. You can find all of the topics we're going to discuss on the show today, including the unusual activity alerts, the news from the options market, and, of course, all of the archived episodes of this fine, fine program. And I am not alone on this program, not by a long shot. Joining me are the rest of my all-star panelists, starting off with the man from the mountains himself. None other than good old Uncle Mike Tusa. Uncle Mike, welcome to the show, sir. Always happy to be here. Now, what am I going to do if, what are you going to do if I ever move to Colorado? Then do I become the man from the, the Plain States? Well, if you move to Colorado, then you'll be the man from the quite literal mountains, as opposed to the figurative mountains that we now ascribe to you. <laughs> ah, got it, got it, got it. Good to know. Just curious. We take a few leaps of logic here on the old Option Block All-Star panel. Not the first time, and certainly won't be the last time. Also joining us, beaming in from the great state of Maine, digging out from under, what, 10, 20 feet of snow, none other than Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Andrew, I'm surprised your internet is working under such an avalanche of snow. <laughs> That's why they put the cables under the ground now. The one cable we have in Maine is underground, I think. They use some old miners. <laughs> we are buried. And it's raining. We have stain, snowy rain right now, killing all the snow. In, on the coast. Well, there you go. You had your one day to go play in the snow before it all got washed away. We, we did. We I, did. I actually, I actually was skiing down to the middle of my town. My cross-country <laughs> skis just do 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 Nothing better to do. It was like, it was like six inches of snow on the ground. We'd have between. They couldn't plow it fast enough. They, they tend to frown on, frown on you doing that here on Wacker Drive in downtown Chicago. I don't know why. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to get around town, but say la vie, they tend yeah, to take a dim we have, view of uh, What do we have? We have one stoplight downtown. <laughs> <laughs> I, need one. To, I need to come see this literal one-horse town that you live in one of these days. It, it is. It is a one-horse one town. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last but certainly not least, the man wearing the jaunty cap. He's none other than Alex Jacobson, the vice president of education, although we know him as the viceroy over there at Options Express. Alex, welcome back to the program, sir. Yeah, good to be here. A lot of, a lot of news today. It's going to be a busy day. Should be a good one. And you, the listeners, many of you have written in to tell us you want more interviews, you want more interviews, you want more interviews. Well, we've heard you, and we're going to accommodate you right now because we're going to kick things off a little bit differently today. Instead of diving right into the trading block, we're going to roll right into the interview block. 
the interview block. All right, and that sound of applause, that roaring applause, means it's time once again for the interview block. You know it, you loved it, you've asked for it on many occasions, and we're finally bringing it back. For you, dear listener, this is, of course, the portion of the show where we bring on someone from throughout the world of options, an expert in a particular field and area of interest, and then we proceed to pick their brain for your enjoyment and edification. And today's guest slash victim is Doug Berman. He is the vice president of agricultural derivatives over there at RCM Asset Management. Doug, welcome to the program. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you can make it, and you have that uh, cacophony of the trading floor behind you to prove to our listeners that you are indeed a live person and not, <laughs> not a robot that we've brought on the show. Now, Doug, as we are wont to do with all of our first time here is on the option block, do us a favor and give our listeners a bit of an overview of your recent history, your recent background in the options and derivatives market and how you wound your way over to being the VP of agricultural derivatives at RCM. Uh, you know, I guess my, uh, my background in agriculture is I was uh, born and raised on a farm in central Illinois. Uh, where my family is still active, ra- actively raising corn and soybeans, along with a few cattle as well. I decided after college I wasn't uh, quite ready to to go home and raise corn and beans yet, so I decided to come to Chicago and learn how to sell corn and beans, um, and hopefully take advantage of opportunities in the uh, in the futures and options markets. I started my career working at um, Iowa Grain Company at the Chicago Board of Trade, uh, you know, a firm that's focused solely on uh, the grains. Uh, following that, I moved on to uh, work with a group of brokers over at MF Global, where we built out a, uh, a division of agricultural trading there. Um, after we moved on from MF Global, we, uh, we started up our own group here at RCM, where I am the person that uh, is in charge of our agricultural trading, um, as well as our fundamental research on the agricultural markets. Uh, it's been a been a pretty uh, pretty volatile past couple of years in the grains, as most people know. Uh, you know, recently we dealt with the drought of 2012, um, which was one for the record books. Right now we're we're kind of focusing on uh, production and weather in South America and how their corn and soybean crops are going to finish out this year. And uh, and you know once we get done with that, then we'll be back to moving on. Uh, to dealing with the extremely dry conditions that we currently have here in the United States and, and, and where we go from there. Now, one thing that I think is uh, kind of interesting, Doug, Mike Tusa here, maybe you can tell our, our, our listeners out there, a lot of them are primarily equity option traders. And you mentioned weather in the corn markets. Now, in the equity option markets, a lot of times there's the there's the skew in options, like, uh, for example, on the S&P, a lot of times the put options that are just out of the money will have a higher price than the call options that are just out of the money just because of the fact that there's a little bit more fear to the downside in the stock market. Can you tell us a little bit about how that would work in the corn market and uh, how that would kind of have an effect also on on the options as well, or uh, also how that would have an effect on weather uh, as well if there's like a fear of a drought or something along those lines? Yeah, there's there's definitely fear in the grain markets, just like there is in the equity markets. Um, it's kind of inverse to what you typically see in the equity markets. Um, you know, corn, the, the price of it really can't go to zero. It's always going to have some value. But if you have a short supply year, the market it doesn't have unlimited upside, but it will go to a price level to the upside where demand slows down. So the fear is that the market goes up rather than lower, um, which gives you a different skew than you typically see with equities where – put options are priced uh, cheaper in the grains than they are the call options. For instance, a 10% out of the money put option in corn right now on the July option uh, is about 33% cheaper than the 10% out of the money call option, for example. That's interesting. So there's obviously more fear of corn going up suddenly as opposed to having a corn crash, so to speak. Yes, definitely. And and when you uh, consider the weather swings that we have seen the past few years, you know that fear is is greater than you know as great as it's ever been, really. Got it. Now, when you do options on corn, are 
what are some of the strategies that you primarily do? A lot of we have a lot of sophisticated listeners on our show. Um, are you primarily selling options, buying options, doing spreads, or what are some of the strategies that you like to do, or what you like to tell your clients to do? Well, with the uh, commodities, there's a very, very strong seasonal tendencies for the markets to to make lows during the time of the year when supply is the greatest, to make highs during the time of year when uh, there's the most uncertainty over supply. Uh, so typically that works out with, um, you know, in corn, seasonally the market will make a low in the fall when we've, uh, when we're harvesting and supply is the greatest. Seasonally we will make our highs in the summer when the fear is the greatest that we could have a drought and that, uh, that supply is going to run short. You know, so, so as far as whether we like to buy or sell options, um, you know, I, I don't really have a preference. Um, I think there's a time for both. Um, obviously, the low volatility times, which is typically in the fall when we're making our seasonal lows, when we we might uh, be more inclined to to take on more longs than shorts in the options. Whereas uh, seasonally, when the market peaks out in the summer, we'd be more inclined to uh, you know be more of a net seller of options. There are some because of the uh, the market does make such volatile seasonal swings, there are great opportunities to take advantage of leverage, both with uh, forward call spreads, you know, shorting one closer to the money call to finance uh, multiple out of the money calls. Uh, typically, that works best uh, if you're trying to buy or get long the market when it's seasonally making the lows in the fall. Uh, vice versa, um, entering back call spreads when uh, you know a weather market has kind of peaked out, usually in the month of July, um, you know I'm more of a net seller of options at that time. Looking at the put side, uh, you know we'll be more of a willing to, to to short puts in the fall when the market is making that seasonal low that I've talked about a couple times, and uh, you know we'll look at at uh, forward put spreads towards the end of the summer when the market's making a seasonal high, when there is a you know a chance to see a nice move to the downside into the harvest. Okay. Now, another thing with corn, you're going to have kind of a, uh, a different type of margin on corn as you would in like a stock. So for example, if I were to buy a hundred shares of uh, Chesapeake energy, uh, it's $2,000 is my risk. Uh, in corn, it's kind of a different ball game uh, as it is with all futures contracts. Uh, can you guys, can you, I'm sorry, can you actually elaborate a little bit on what some of the contract specs are for corn, what some of the margin requirements are and that type of thing? So for example, let's say I wanted to just get long corn futures, what would be my ultimate risk assuming corn went to zero? I know it wouldn't go to zero, or I doubt it would go to zero, uh, but what would be my risk if corn went to zero and I was long? And then what would the margin requirement be on the future side? And then maybe tell us a little bit how the options would work as well. Uh, currently with corn at, uh, corn is priced in 5,000 bushel uh, contracts or corn contracts are 5,000 bushels, and it's priced in cents per bushel. Uh, right now, it's it's near seven dollars, so one contract of corn has a notional value of thirty-five thousand dollars, roughly. Margin to take a position in the corn market right now is about twenty-seven hundred dollars a contract. So twenty-seven hundred divided by thirty-five thousand, uh, you know, you're looking right around seven to eight percent of the notional of, of value of the contract to, to take a position in the market. The options, you know, are the options work the same as equity options do. Um, you know, if you want to take a long option position, you know, you you only have to come up with the value of the option. A twenty cent a call option that you pay twenty cents for is gonna run you a thousand bucks. Short option positions uh, are gonna be margin very similar to futures, although there is a little bit of a, a discount. So if you wanted to short a, let's say a, a July corn 650 put, if you wanted to short it for 20 cents, um, you know the margin on something like that, where you would, you'd have maximum profit potential of 20 cents, the margin is probably going to be in the ballpark of $1,500. Okay. Now, typically when you do a trade. Uh, Doug, how long are you in a trade? So like when you're, let's say, uh, you're doing one of your back spreads or uh, you're, you're selling premium or whatever the case may be, typically how long is the duration of your trade? And um, do you typically, and I guess this, and I have another question on top of that. What typically do you, is your strike price and uh, time frame selection? Are you typically front month? Do you typically go three months out? Or uh, I guess just maybe tell us a little bit about a typical trade for Doug. 
Uh, typically, these trades, the trades with the options that I'm in, uh, you know, on the short end, I would say a month and a half to two months. Uh, the long end, you know, three to three and a half months. And that kind of goes back to the seasonal seasonality that I was talking about. Um, you know, that's how long the moves from uh, from a seasonal low to a seasonal high are going to last. Usually, we want to give ourselves uh, plenty of time. Like right now, the the July options are are what I've been uh, having customers trade in, which have about 130 days to expiration right now. Um, you know, if we do get a, a decent move, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to to be holding those options all the way to expiration, um, where where we can really get hurt on time value. Hey, Doug, Alex Jacobson and Options Express. Um, uh, uh, with that much difference in volatility, why don't the, the traders on the floor or customers do simple reversals to, to arm some of that fall out? Uh, they do. <laughs> they do. And, uh, you know, that is, that is something that, uh, you know, towards the end of, end of a big bull run when uh, when the calls are really, really out of line with the skew. I mean, right now, the, the skew that I mentioned earlier is actually uh, quite low compared to compared to typically what it'll be, or later on this summer if we do get into a, some type of weather market. So, I mean, that, that's the thing you have to keep in mind is knowing, uh, you know, what is normal and what's not normal. Uh, you know, at, at first glance, someone will jump all over that, uh, a simple reversal play like that, but uh, if you if you went back and looked back at the past few years, um, it's really uh, you know not as extreme as one would imagine. Doug, what size can you trade in the options without impacting the market? Uh, you know, in corn, it's an extremely liquid market. You know, you can trade 100 lots, which 100 contracts is you know 500,000 bushels at a crack. Um, that's a it's a very large or I mean it's a it's a it's a decent sized position and and not a, not going to be you know not going to affect the market significantly. So with, with spam margining, I could do the risk reversal in significant size uh, without really putting up a ton of money once I get the reversal done. Correct. I mean compared to. Compared to the value of the underlying position, the amount of funds you would have to put up would probably be right around that, you know, six or seven percent. Cool. What time do markets open tomorrow? I want to come in early. <laughs> uh, the floor, uh, which is when the big money comes in, opens at 9:30 Central Time. Now, Doug, I know a lot of our listeners tend to favor the products that they can put in their equities, the equity options account, their securities account, as opposed to the futures realm in spite of all the all the arguments we've made in the favor of the futures on this show in the past so what's your opinion of this growing slate of etfs and funds and structured products that attempt to mimic the ag the ag markets out there like corn and others uh, do you use them at all do you like them do you recommend them or do you think they're all pretty much a waste of time what's your opinion on that growing universe of etps and etfs and other products uh, being on the future side, obviously, I'm not a huge fan, uh, or else I would be on that side. Um, but, you know, I think you can go back and look at the track record of many of these ETFs over the past two or three years and realize that, you know, they do not do a good job of, of exposing you to the, the, the market that you want to be exposed to. Um, you know, if you're looking at one of these broader-based ETFs, maybe it does, but you know, if if you if you if you have any knowledge of a specific commodity, which we're talking about corn here, um, I think I do a pretty good job of helping my guys. Uh, you know, knowing the overall fundamental outlook of the market. If you want to take a real position in the corn market, futures are by far the most efficient way to do that. Or the futures and options commodities market is by far the most efficient way to do that. Well, Doug, we're glad you could join us on the program here today. And listeners, if you like what Doug had to say, and if you're interested in diving even deeper into the corn and ag futures and options realm, then Doug will be doing a webinar on the old RCM webinar train this Wednesday, February 
14th. Oh, I'm sorry, 13th. So I thought you were doing it on Valentine's Day, but you're you're ahead of the great day of love, so I don't think that'll be a big conflict for many of our listeners. So indeed, if you're interested in checking out that webinar, we'll have a link on the Options Insider. You can, of course, find it on the RCM website as well. So look forward to that and register if you're looking forward to hearing more of what Doug has to say. And Doug, we want to thank you for coming on the program. We'll have to bring you back on again down the road so we can dive even more into the ag realm that I know is so interesting to a lot of our listeners these days. I look forward to hearing it. Hopefully everyone can make it on Wednesday, and I look forward to being back on the show. Great. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. All right, and that's going to do it for the interview block, and now we're going to dive right into the trading block. The trading block. All right, and welcome to the trading block. This is, of course, where we peer into the action that occurred on the street today. And it was a bit of a meandering day overall from a broad market perspective. Most of the major indices closing down fractionally on the day. No real significant movers there. We were a little bit up towards the earlier part of the session. We since gave that up towards the end of the day. Not an unusual performance compared to what we've seen of late. And, of course, the VIX Cash giving up a little bit as well, down about about oh, fractionally on the day as well. Not really, not really much to say there either. VIX Cash hovering right around the 13 handle still. I think one of the interesting narratives we've seen so far, we are still deep in earnings season. And one of the interesting things we talked about on a recent show about how earnings have been coming out better than anticipated. And a lot of these names post earnings have been faring a lot better than I think a lot of people anticipated. You know, we saw SIBO, SIBO rallying strong after their earnings. Activision talked about them last week. They're hitting a uh, new 52 week highs. Seems like every day post earnings, Microsoft rallying hard on the strength, apparently of surface, uh, even though windows eight, I'm, I started using it this past week. Can't say I'm, I'm deeply uh, enthusiastic so far. Maybe it'll grow on me. I don't know. Uh, we got Chipotle, all these other names, all really rallying post earnings earnings and uh, continuing to uh, to buoy this market up. Uh, Andrew, what, aside from a, a relatively uneventful day in the VIX, what really caught your eye in today's action? Uh, mostly that the VIX couldn't rally. You know, we had the weekend effect, VIX opened up a little bit and then spent most of the day kind of just trying to go back down. So I'm trying to figure out how their uh, pricing, you know, options you know, index options right now. The SKU in general is pretty steep. We have pretty low at the money vol, and it's it just kind of setting up like a market that wants to keep rallying. So, I mean, as far as that kind of stuff goes, besides, of course, Zynga, which is taken off to the races. Um, yes, I forgot to mention your, your pick of the year here. <laughs> Zynga just turning on a dime, and as it, it took away from you, now it is giving back. In spades. You're looking like a pro here. Zynga tra- closing today up another 7% to close at $3.67. It's a full dollar higher than when we were talking about it this time last week. So I quite know, the run in Zynga. I know. That was, well, you know, you have to get one thing right on, on a show. And when you do like, you know, what, 50 something shows a week. <laughs> <laughs> You've had more more than one. We'll give you that. Um, All right, did you, did, not, I know you were about. talking. I'm sorry. You were talking on the last show about about starting to to pick up some of the upside here. Have you been doing that? Have you been yeah, waiting I and seeing? I actually, I'm roll. I rolled. I was able to roll out of upside and now buy just totally financed upside. So now I got the position for free for six months. So now I'm just going to keep it. Not a bad thing, you know. It's quite often when you do these these bullish risk reversals, you know, you have the uh, the the put portion pays off pretty well, and then you, but you never really get that wind to make up the upside portion of it, and you have to do a lot of uh, doing stuff, as you like to say, Andrew, to really make that position work out well. Or you wait, you do the opposite end of the coin, you wait until there's a bit of an up move, then you leg into the upside portion of it rather than doing it all at once. Uh, here you had a, an opportunity, a very rare opportunity to have that bullish risk reversal pay off in essentially one one fell swoop, which is a, a rare, a rare thing. I think there's probably two names. And the one time, of course, I didn't trade bullish risk reversals on either of them. Activision, I, I like to do a lot of bullish risk reversals going into their <laughs> earnings as well. Off. They took <laughs> off to the races, too. I looked at it and I said, you know what? I'm just too busy this week. I can't stay on top of this like I want to. I'm not going to put it on. And then sure enough, it, it blows way out of its range. This is the one time I was really thinking about levering to the upside, too. It just had that had that feel to it. But, you know, it's one of those things. I need to... Uh, I need to employ Uncle Mike Tussaud to walk my limits for me, or perhaps use the old uh, Options Express walk limit functionality. 
mentality. I do it all for. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, there's 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 ways to do it. You yeah, just gotta, you know, you know, you just gotta go do it. I need Harvey. I need Harvey the trading to, robot. You have to find people to do stuff for you. <laughs> <laughs> there you Either go. breathing or or electronically. You know, I mean, look at all the choices you have right in front of you, in front of your very eyes, my man. I'm getting too big to push the button on the mouse myself. I need others I, to do that for me. You are just getting <laughs> so <hard. laughs> All right, Uncle Mike, what caught your eye in today's action? It was, uh, you know, we had a little bit of life in your favorite fruit company. Uh, what else is really catching your eye these days? Hey, we had a little bit of a life in Apple. That's true. The other thing that I noticed today is Google. Uh, Google kind of, we <clears throat> were around the, the highs. We're knocking on 800's door with Google right now. And so uh, it sold off in the morning and actually got as low as 773, but it came back a lot towards the end of the day. So I'm curious to see uh, how Google is going to be reacting over the course of this week, uh, headed to the 800 mark or saying the hex with it and going home. Are you telling me that you're going to start putting the uh, the grandmas from Iowa who are in your, your clients, you're going to start dabbling in some goog? Is that the next big holding on the RCM front? I don't know about that, but you said what was catching my eye, <laughs> so we'll just stay with that. For now, I'm happy in my nice, boring 12 puts on Ford. So you're saying you're blasting out the seven and a half puts in Google right now? I'm not saying, no, I'm saying I'm watching it. <laughs> I'm just trying to put words in your mouth. Make I know, it kind of I fun. know. Yeah, heck, what the heck, let's short Google. Short the 775 put. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And, you know, and the cool thing about it is that you can get that lev that 4 to 1 leverage when you short the put. That's what I like about it. There you go. There you go. Printing, it's a license really to print money. We should really, I, we should really be selling this show. You're foolish not to do it. <laughs> there you go. I think we should retitle it. This, retitle the show. Yeah. Let's Get rich by selling puts in eight hundred dollar stocks. There you go. If you love <laughs> if you love your family. <laughs> the kids, college education, paid for in a couple months. No sweat. <laughs> Who needs annuities when you can sell puts on Google? Exactly. Exactly. Did somebody used to be saying that about Apple at some point? You could sell the seven hundred puts. Oh yeah, that's true. Ten dollars with a premium. Well, they were. There was. Then, then was, they went to 100 bucks. What was the expression on the floor in IBM? Sell the 80s, buy Mercedes? Yes. Long time ago. Well, that was. That was. That was before it went like to 28 bucks again or something like that. Yeah. In like 92. I remember watching, though, looking at IBM when it was going, when it was having all those troubles. Like, guys were selling every call, like short, like 60s, 55s, if just all the way down when that, when, you know. I guess the mainframe was dead, the PC was rising, and Microsoft was going to take over the world. That was like, what, 92 or something like that. Um, of course, that was the dead bottom, but they did hate that. They hated that stock something fierce. Speaking of, of Microsoft and, and blasting out little little puts, it's a similar story. I just want to keep, it keeps popping to mind whenever I hear people talking about this kind of stuff. It, when I was still out trading Intel, I remember I had a guy next to me who was an old-timer from the floor. Had a couple of kids who were about to go to college or about that age. And I remember we, we had just finished up I believe it was expiration Friday, so we had just finished up for that day, and there was a thousand, a couple of thousand of some uh, very near-term but out-of-the-money calls sitting on the book for a teeny. This is still when you're trading for teenies. And uh, they were just sitting there, sitting there. And, of course, Microsoft earnings were after the close, so anything could happen with Intel posting. I remember all of a sudden that order vanished. I turned around next to me, and I saw the guy. <laughs> he, did, he, sh he was showing me the ticket. He had blasted them all out, just completely naked, blasting out a couple of thousand they were less than 5% out of the money, probably 3%. Uh, I remember just looking at him saying, don't you have kids about to go? Don't you have a house? What, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and he was so proud and giddy of this trade. He had to show me the ticket. And I remember just thinking, my God, man, how have you survived down here all this time? <laughs> uh, it's one of those stories. He where... exactly the teenies to sell. Yeah, I guess. that's the. Uh, he's a very nimble teeny seller. Uh, yep. Moral of the story, listeners, is uh, if you if you appreciate your house and your fine belongings and your family and whatnot, uh, don't do that on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, Alex, what uh, what caught your eye in today's activity, sir? Uh, today, all the chatter here was Apple is back on the screen again. Uh, LinkedIn and Priceline were uh, were active here today. So, uh, you know, kind of the typical names. Uh, see some people setting up for expiration, and this will be an interesting expiration because after the run, we have a lot of stuff sitting right around strike. Uh, a lot of the oil companies, a lot of the oil service. Of course, Facebook uh, 
It's got dollar strike. So even though it's traded down, it's got a lot of stuff uh, near strike. So that's what was keeping us busy today and uh, uh, sat on a couple of conference calls today and have some new pricing I'll talk about in a minute or two. And then listen to your comment about Windows 8. Uh, Schwab is going to be switching over to Windows 8 on all its machines. Oh, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, Alex, is all I could say. I have two machines here now running it, and I want to smash them uh, about five times an hour repeatedly. Uh, yeah. I, I, won't, I won't bore you or my listeners with, with the horror story so far, but let's just say there's a difference between the Windows 8 apps and the actual desktop apps that you want to use, and that is quite frustrating. I was trying to, we do a lot of Skype here, obviously Skype, a native Microsoft product. Now I thought it would work seamlessly with everything. And it is indeed built into Windows 8, but it's a Windows 8 app. And if you actually want to use it on the desktop and use it, actually actually would use it, you have to go find this almost secret hidden Windows 8 for desktop application that's buried way on the Skype uh, homepage and then download that and log in. It's a, shall we say, that's just emblematic of the many problems that are going on with Windows 8 right now. There's some good ideas there, but overall just... Uh, a frustrating mess, at least for me right now. I can see this being great if I had a touchscreen tablet on my desktop, forcing me to navigate through all this nonsense to get to the desktop where I want to do my work. That's uh, perhaps not ideal. Oh, and you mentioned Apple. Really quick, Uncle Mike, I'm guessing the, the Apple people are, are flocking over at Options Express and elsewhere because of A, the dividend talk, and B, of course, the, all the growing love for the Apple smartwatch that is, of course, soon to be upon us if you believe the rumor mongers. So I'm sure you're going to start loading up on some more Apple ahead of the impending Apple smartwatch launch, correct? Not a bad idea, but still not ready to do it yet. So in, if I can translate that for our listeners, uh, you're blasting out the 460 puts right now in Apple. Uh, nope, not all. I'm buying the 550 calls. Oh, even better. <laughs> Come on now. If I'm going to be crazy, if you're going to make up stuff about me, at least make me be a real gambler. Come go on big now. Or go home, baby. That's right. That's how we play it here on the old option block. All right. And that's going to do it for the trading block. A very silly trading block today, but a fun one nonetheless. And speaking of silly, it's now time to don our fedoras and our trench coat because it is time once again to journey to the dark side of the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, and that funky tune means it's time once again for the Odd Block. This is, of course, the portion of the program where Andrew and I throw caution to the wind and venture deep into the heart of the seedy side of the options business. And today we're going to kick things off here on the Odd Block with a name that we haven't talked about that many times in the Odd Block. It's kind of a perennial standout. We don't really highlight it too often on the unusual activity tip it is of course a bank of america ticker symbol bac closing today up about one percent on the day to eleven dollars and 86 cents this is the name that puts up some numbers of late put up about an average of four hundred thousand of late of course that's a little bit inflated today doing nearly three hundred thousand on the day but there were a couple of trades out here that caught our eye uh, looks like a lot of love here for these uh, weekly 11 half puts senior andrew See, I, I, you know, I didn't look at, I didn't have the 11 and a half puts. The one I wrote on was like right on the opening, somebody sold a put spread in August and then it felt like they were rolling, you know, cause the, the only thing that rallied solidly all day were the financials kind of like never sort of gave it up. Sort of just kept kind of going up and up and up. I didn't even see the 11 and a half put trade. I was looking at a roll in August, the eight ten put spread. It looks like somebody was six. Uh, either rolling their short eight ten puts, buying them back, and then moving up to the tens. That's that's what it looked like uh, to me. So, you, you mean eight nine puts and then up to the tens, correct? Uh, it looked like it looked like from the eight puts up. Jeez, Louise. All right. No, what I'm saying, yes, it looks like he rolled from the August eight line to the ten line, and they're I mean they're only picking up twenty seven cents for this spread to August. Um. You know, the volatility is pretty low. Um, I'm just saying this is more of, um, oh, the uh, the nine puts traded as well. Uh, when this trade went up, it was just the spread. So 
My, my big comment on it in general, though, is this is a lot more aggressive put selling than we've seen in a long time, like this kind of trade. This is kind of bull markety trade stuff. This, you know, re like, this reeks of Mr. Grigas right here, both in size and the fact that I know he's long from around the eight half nine level. So exactly. uh, he's just blasting out more. <laughs> <laughs> he's rolling his hedge up, baby. So I, that's what I just, I'm, it's a different kind of, you know, I know people sell puts all the time, but now they're going in and selling the 10 level puts in bank in August for 27 cents. You know, this spread. So I, I just, you know, and this spread is, is capped risk and whatnot, but, you know, I, I just I just see this as a more uh, aggressive type of long delta. That was my big comment. That's what that's what's starting to you know uh, surprise me. Now here's a goofy one. The part of this is I like to find the goofy ones too. This is a stock that's been I think totally hammered. It used to be quite a high flyer. Uh, AMSC, uh, American Superconductor Semiconductor. They sell stuff to uh, I think the wind turbines or. One of those green green companies, like two years ago, I think it was a $25 or $30 stock. Uh, it's just rallied uh, up 10% to $3.16. And somebody bought the March 4 calls for a nickel. Now, I'm, I'm not, it wasn't a huge block. It was only 200 contracts, but it only trades 353 contracts a day. I'm starting to, I'm looking at, uh, a, you know, a sell of some bank puts. Now somebody's buying, which I would say is, you know, worthless calls for a nickel. Uh, even though they're not a lot, it's still significant for a name that really hasn't done much. Now, granted, the stock is starting to move a little bit. And there was zero open interest prior to this purchase. So, you know, it, that almost qualifies as like two stop buying the 600s in Apple, I think. I'm yeah, that, to that's pretty it. aggressive. <laughs> Looks like so some, someone was a little scared. Five fifties, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like someone was a little scared today of earnings. Of course, they had earnings after the bell today, and looks like they're they closed at three dollars and thirteen cents. They're off a wee bit in the after hours, trading about a dime south. So not no no big move there. It looks like someone was a little bit nervous as well because they closed out about a uh, thousand twelve hundred of the Feb threes that they were short for about uh, looks like about a quarter. Yeah, so that's I aggressive. Mean, um. You know, 33, I mean, I guess people are looking at some of these, like Netflix, and going, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> there is, there's almost no short interest left in AMSC, because everybody's already made so much money, they don't care anymore. Yeah, hopefully that guy's well, short from, like, $3, and he's just closing it out for a quarter, he doesn't care anymore. Exactly, so I, I just, I found, like, it's just real, you know, kind of waste of money paper, you know, we know, like, we, we like to have those every once in a while. This one is just, this is one of my favorite stocks. I own this stock personally, uh, Walgreens. Uh, somebody just bought 14,741 calls for a dollar four in March. Vol is super cheap, and I think they, you could blink, and the guy's probably going to make money on those. That's almost good enough to just follow along type of trade. Walgreens is, I think, trading 52-week highs, but just a... Just you know, just a huge buyer. Uh, there is 11,000 uh, contracts open interest, so the size to me means there's actually this is like new, new paper buying uh, more options and, and generating more open interest. So I, I'm, I, I have like this. I'm not ready to be go go bullish, but I'm telling you, some of the some of this paper is a little more interesting. Plus the vol so cheap. Buying options is starting to make a little more sense if you want to get bullish in some of these names. Just saying. Maybe we'll make a note of this one. Uh, looks like about nearly 18,000 total went up on the day today of these March 41s. This, I think this one's worth watching. I yeah. think this guy's going to make 50% on his so money. So we'll there. make a note on this for you, dear listeners here, of this trade going up today in these March 41 calls. And we'll circle back to it in a couple of weeks uh, looks like we don't have any earnings on the horizon. They no, were, they no. already, yeah, nothing for a while. So this guy's just, this guy's just in your camp, Andrew. He's feeling the love for Walgreens. He says they're going to kick I, the crap out of Rite Aid. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and to me, it's always a layup. Walgreens is my favorite drugstore, which is why I own the stock. I mean, if my <laughs> wife likes it, that's it. She's like, she like everything she likes goes up. So I, I have no. <laughs> You're the degenerate underlying buyer amongst us here, sir. And uh, oh, wag. Yeah. Wag holding down the old Andrew portfolio. Interesting stuff. Make a note of it, listeners. We'll check back in on Wag. Anything else? Lighten up your tape here on the old Skid Row today. Last one is another like panic call cover here uh, in uh, Warner Chilcott, a stock that really 
doesn't do very much. WCRX trading off its highs, kind of sleepy. But again, somebody just paying up and buying some calls, you know, basically 3,000 contracts. It was like 2,800 and 200, I think. Buying the Feb 15 calls for 15 cents, just like, you know, they posted a 15, uh, 15 cent bid, got filled, left it up there. They traded 10 cents after that. Just, just, you know, just a big block of calls for calls expiring here in a couple of days. That is now, a panic buy. They're at a dime right now. This guy paid I, up to close it. <laughs> I think so. So I think there is like a little bit of worry. Uh, some people have some short calls and they don't want them getting called away. You know, they kind of have done their thing. And now people are starting to close their, these, some of these positions. So I've, Again, I find that's a different type of market. You know, nobody cared about closing short calls, you know, in October maybe or something like that when uh, uh, the huge upside really wasn't in the cards. Um, but, you know, you're seeing some more of that paper now, more of it's showing up. I'm seeing like flips of it in different places. So that might, again, you're always looking for a tone change in the market. And to me, the tape is always the best tone. And right now the tape is still, you know, it's, it's a little, it's a little longish. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, people panicking yeah, to the upside here. Upside crash imminent, says Andrew Giovanazzi. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is interesting. This guy obviously probably feeling some pain back from a few weeks ago when this name gapped up or up to about 15, 20, 15, 30, uh, and probably didn't want a repeat of that. So he took his opportunity to close out a ton of them. Paid up a bit to do it, but if he wants to get, he wants to sleep at night, perhaps take some of his money off the table and some of his profits off the table, then perhaps not the worst trade. Uh, but yeah, not the most patient buy either on the planet. So no, just like clunk, I'm yeah, buying them. I'm out. Maybe he had a risk. He had a risk manager breathing down his neck, saying, "What the hell are you doing?" Showed all his upside in WCRX, and uh, exactly. he decided maybe they closed it out for him. That reeks of <laughs> that reeks of a risk manager hitting cancel or close. <laughs> One of those types of you trades. You are out. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that, Mr. Andrew. And now we shall take off our fedoras. Until next, we are called upon. And we shall instead roll right on into the Express Block. The Express Block, brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading, from advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources. Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express allows you to trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account on powerful yet easy to use trading platforms, including mobile devices. Visit optionsexpress.com/oxradio for your free account. Options Express Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, listeners, this is the portion of the show where Alex takes the reins over at OX, and I get to take a bit of a breather. So, Mr. Alex, I know you teased us last week about some impending pricing changes over there at OX. Our listeners have been waiting with bated breath all weekend long to finally hear what you were talking about. So, Alex, by all means, illuminate our anxious listeners. So thanks, Mark. Big big pricing change in futures uh, for all OX customers, all Schwab customers. Futures and futures options will now be three dollars and fifty cents. That's half of uh, what the best rate was prior to now, uh, plus exchange fees and NFA fees. Uh, there used to be a trading fee attached attached to the trade. That's now gone. Uh, but futures and futures options, uh, you start to think about some of these multipliers doing an option on uh, something like the E-mini where you've got a, a five multiplier versus things like the the spider. You're doing five times the notional value for $3.50. You could kind of translate that into an equity option at $0.70. Cents. Um, we talked earlier about things like corn options where you have significant multipliers, this really brings costs down. And as we talked about last week, Schwab had cut fees on 105 ETFs. Uh, I, I, uh, I'd say my crystal ball seems to indicate that transaction costs are gonna continue to come down. The competition in the industry is great for the customer and we're seeing uh, lower transaction costs and uh, we're seeing them in a relatively modest volatility, still not great volume environment, uh, but it appears that the trend is to make things uh, less expensive. The 
one of the calls I was sitting on today, and I sat on a lot of calls today, but one of the calls I was sitting on today uh, talked about how since uh, Schwab cut the the transactions costs on the uh, on the ETFs, they have quickly run to over 10 billion in uh, notional ETFs on their books. And I know to a lot of our clientele, uh, a lot of our listeners are not ETF traders. Uh, here at OX, obviously the mix is different than it is at Schwab, uh, but there's clearly a trend here about costs coming in. And uh, my crystal ball says if we get a pop in rates, firms become much more profitable because that's a lot of where they earn their money. And I wouldn't be surprised to see other fees uh, positively impacted by an increase in uh in rates, but half price on that's an impressive reduction. A half price essentially, half price sale over yeah. there at Schwab. I like that. That's really Schwab planting their flag and saying, Hey, we're serious about making an impact here in the futures and futures options realm and we're going to make our costs commensurate with that. And that, that just shows that this is not a, a second hand initiative on their part. They're really serious about making inroads in that space. Yeah, and that and that's part of why they bought us. They bought us for the futures and options DNA, and and uh, we now have what are called duals. Uh, we now have folks that have both Schwab accounts and OX accounts, and we've opened a special desk in Indianapolis just for those duals. They got to see this pricing uh, late Friday, the $3.50 pricing. But I, I think there's a trend here in the industry, and the competition is going to be – ETF competition is clearly – out there already. I mean, you see all the big ETF providers looking for more distribution. And the great thing about competition is, in the end, it benefits uh, the customer. And I know sometimes when you say that, you say, well, uh, that's just the company line, you know. But keep in mind that I, I was somebody who left SIBO a little more than a decade ago when there were still exchange fees to trade options uh, to go to an all electronic market. And and quickly, you know, options got a lot cheaper and volume quadrupled. Uh, you bring the friction down and uh, it becomes a better marketplace. Well, that's a continuance of the narrative I know John had when we first launched the show. You know, obviously, OX, even prior to the Schwab days, had acquired Express Trade and were making serious inroads into that space. And John would routinely bring up the different initiatives they had going on on the futures and futures options side of the fence over at OX. And like I said, this really just continues that narrative with a pretty resounding <laughs> vote of confidence it sounds like that hey we're here to stay in this in this space and we're going to make it worth your while to come do your futures with us yeah this is big uh this is much cheaper than we've been uh there are no hidden or added, fee added fees you don't pay to use the trading desk if you want to use the trading desk uh as i've mentioned on earlier shows we're building a the ideas hub now out into futures options and hopefully that'll be ready in the next quarter or, or, or two. Uh, right now in futures options, you can do a two legged ticket electronically and in, in securities options, you can do a four legged ticket, but uh, you're going to see, I think this is the beginning of a continuing trend. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more announcements from you on this show in the in the weeks and months to come, Alex, as you continue to slash prices over there uh, at OX slash Schwab. So look forward to that, dear listeners. Uh, Alex may have some, some good news for you on future shows as we continue, hopefully, this trend of really being aggressive in this space and at the end of the day, benefiting the end user, which is what all this stuff is about. All right. Thank you for that, Alex. And now we're going to wrap up the old express block and dive right into our final segment Around the Block. Around the Block. All right, and those car horns mean that it is time for our final segment, indeed, the Around the Block segment. And as we hit on at the top of the show, there really were, uh, we're still in the heart of earnings season. Uh, we've moved past some of the big names, but there still are a few Lurking on the horizon, as we touched on on last week's episode, uh, cover your ears, Uncle Mike, good old Cisco coming out 
in a couple of days on the 13th, which is a Wednesday. Of course, you may be already too busy attending that webinar to pay attention to Cisco earnings. But if you're not, then or perhaps you can do two things at the same time. A uh, live person is another one that's coming out. We talked also about uh, NVIDIA. They are also on the 13th. 13th, a busy day for earnings. You guys, Andrew, you've been on the show more recently. Uh, in the earliest days of the option block, we had a name that we like to talk about a lot on the show was Radian, ticker symbol RDN. This thing was all over the map. It was trading $10. It was trading $2. It was an odd block favorite, a staple. I used to talk about it all the time. Mark and I used to have a ball blasting out upside when some of these things were just getting way out of control. Uh, that name has been down in the uh, in the two half range of late. Now it's trading today. It closed at $6.51 and it's got earnings in the after hours hovering around that level. Uh, this is a really crazy name to watch. If you're an option trader looking for some vol, RDN certainly does not disappoint uh just look at the chart of this thing over the past uh, yeah, wasn't six some, months didn't some guys sell some calls in this one yeah I, I, wasn't it, it was like a couple a of years ago I yeah it was, bought a bunch yeah mark and i it was so ridiculous i think at the time there were the nine or ten calls and people were paying up for such a premium for these things that that after the show after we talked about it mark and i both raced out to, to sell them because it was just the most ridiculously aggressive uh it was like we were talking about today paying up but they weren't closing they were just open nakedly buying it might have even been the 11 calls it was some ridiculously high up upside out of the money uh type of thing that was just absurd and it was one of those things that as a as an option trader you really can't resist uh, there's so many ways you can spread it off and do other things against it that it just it made no sense and therefore was a fantastic uh fantastic trade to take the other side of rdn coming out today looks like they're unched on the earnings tonight uh someone picking up two thousand of the feb sevens maybe a panic close there as well seven thousand <laughs> open on that strike so this this name uh two thousand of the march seven so yeah people may be panicking the close out upside here as well continuing our narrative from today but this is the fun one i'm not sure if you had a chance to watch it art andrew but radian group i actually look because it was two bucks and it's kind of been poking around isn't this like the same business like mtg and they provide some uh they're an insurance their insurance on financial products uh maybe. yeah they're uh, a, they call themselves a credit enhancement company for uh, mortgage insurance residential mortgage insurance and, and that side of thing they've they're kind of all over the map, hence their st their stock price. <laughs> right, and, and this probably was a ninety dollars stock in two thousand and seven, as well. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Pre <laughs> pre AIG, this thing was probably all like you know AOL nineteen ninety nine levels. Uh, yeah, but it's had quite the downtrend. Yeah, it was trading uh, in the two dollar range as recently as June of last year. It has since been trending upwards, but it was even trading in the three handle not that long ago, uh, September October range. So this thing has just been on a tear, and uh, fun one to watch if you're looking for some vol. They're out today. Uh, so you may have missed your chance. Hopefully you're not one of the people panicking and buying that upside. And then, of course, also on the 13th, another name we like to watch here, uh, particularly when John was back on the show, he and I loved selling downside here, was Tesla. This name just lighting up the tape since the Model S got picked up. We talked about it on the last show. Alex said he has several of them in his garage uh, for his driving uh, enjoyment and said this is a fantastic car. Um, but, yeah, a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on here. And Tesla, they're coming out on the 13th after the close as well. So a lot of names to keep and I, on aside from those names, uh, Mr. Tusa, what are you watching for the next few sessions into the end of the week? Google 800, Apple 500, S&P 1550, Dow 14,000. We got a lot of key numbers going on, folks, and I am staring at every one of them. So what happens with Google 800? What's the Mike Tusa next step? Are you going to start uh, legging into some bullish risk reversals here? Are you gonna, what, what's, what's the next step? Um, well, yeah, I got a plan. And you know what step one of the plan is? Get a plan. <laughs> there we go. That's a good plan, sir. <laughs> so you're just watching it for uh, just just for fun right now. But someday you may do something with that level. Oh, for fun, yeah. At this point, it's still fun, but um, perhaps it might get really fun pretty soon. Okay. Thank you for that, Uncle Mike. And Mr. Andrew, what are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? I am watching uh, basic actually it's kind of the same stuff he is. Just looking at, I think uh, we're probably around about ready to hit the low in VIX. Probably I don't see it going down below 12. So a lot of fun out of the short vol, which has paid the bills the last year, is probably going to be over. Uh, but I think on the flip side, uh, you might be actually be able to make money like buying calls and doing ratio call spreads and stuff like that. And actually might be worth having some upside leverage if, you know, the public really isn't in the market yet, and they probably won't be till we're trading 15,000. So you're going to want to be ready for that to at least let uh, watch stocks start to move again. So we're, we're seeing some of it with some of these, you know, kind of crazy like LinkedIn, Netflix, and all these just insane short covering rallies. 
So maybe, you know, we'll start seeing some again. So I'm, I, I think the surprise is going to be kind of in like the name equities kind of jumping up uh, in ways that they really just haven't been doing over the last few years. Uh, and that's mostly because there's just going to be cash going in. I mean, we really haven't seen like like the high high cash with the HFT and everybody kind of jumping in at once, you know, only really on the indexes and stuff like that. We haven't really seen a lot of equity pile on in a really long time. So, you know, and I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, looking and looking and waiting for those things to happen. But we're starting to see it in a couple of places. All right. And Alex, what are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? I'm in uh, line with Mike and Andrew. I think uh, uh, the public is going to start coming in at some of these levels. And, you know, we joke about 800 on Google, but uh, uh, this kind of environment, I think we could generally see some some panic buying. Uh, you know, the great thing about being owned by Schwab is we now have this vast database of, of what customers did. And they were clearly out in December. Uh, shortly, I'll have the the Jan numbers, um, the industry still sees a lot of money moving away from direct investment, go, going into, as we talked about earlier, ETFs and mutual funds. But to Andrew's point, I think at some point the uh, people are going to start picking up the names again. And uh, I think we'll see that in big cap. Uh, and I think we'll see it in energy. And uh, let's say Google and Apple, we can – joke about it but they're they're going to trade through you know 100 areas and that's going to make for an interesting market all right thank you for that alex and unfortunately that's all the time we have for this episode of the option block it was a great one glad we can get the old interview block fired up again that's always a popular one i know with you the listeners and speaking of you the listeners i always like to check in with my cohorts here on the all-star panel before we go to see what they have coming up in their respective necks of the woods that may interest you the listener and starting off with you sir from the great state of maine mr andrew aka the rock lobster what is coming up in the land of the pit uh coming up on the option pit i don't know if we have anything coming up on the option pit right now we uh mark and i are talking about we are launching a new website and the updated silver course uh, which is every everything you need to know about the trading options from the beginning point of view. So the option pit is getting a new enhanced updated website with silver, with our silver course, which is basically our intro to options, but geared from a kind of a floor trader being able to read the screen perspective. Um, and that should be up and ready to go within the next uh, week or so. And that's, that's our, our next big item uh, coming out from us. All right, thank you for that, Andrew. And next up, Alex, I know the OX educational team has been going all over the place. Minneapolis, uh, down in Texas, I believe. They've really been just running the gamut of locations for webinars and seminars. So what is coming up next in OX land? Actually had a great crowd in Dallas, and the crew actually got in uh, before it started snowing in Chicago and got back uh, before it started raining uh, February 23rd, Saturday in Indianapolis. That will be simulcast if you can't make the live event. Uh, March 9th in Chicago at the Western Lombard. And I plan on joining the crew out there for uh, that one. All the events are free. Uh, all the webinars are free. Uh, I just put up four webinars for Ideas Hub. Uh, there are a handful of futures webinars up there. Folks should come to the site, optionsexpress.com. All the education is free, and we're building out the archives. So some of the stuff that we do live and simulcast, some of the stuff that we do live and record, uh, we'll have an archive up there shortly so you can enjoy uh, the presentations uh, at your convenience. Great. Looking forward to that, Alex. And Mr. Tusa, I think I know what's coming up in RCM land. That webinar train just keeps on a rolling. It does. It does. We'll be talking about corn this Wednesday night. And then next week, we're actually going to be having a CTA to be named later. Uh, coming on the show on Monday for the interview block, uh, talking about S&P options. We're trying to get him booked. Uh, we think we have him, but we just want to make sure that it's either going to be him or another gentleman. And um, a lot of things coming in the next couple of weeks. We're excited. Oh, CTA, TBD. Those are my favorite webinars. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Uncle Mike. And, of course, 
And of course, as always, we like to recommend to you after you're done listening to this fine program to head on over to theoptionsinsider.com. You can find out more about all the topics we discussed on the show today, the trading, the unusual activity, the breaking news, etc., etc. Of course, you can also find archived episodes of this and every other program on the Options Insider Radio Network. And you can also share your comments, your questions, your deepest, innermost feelings with us here on the Option Block All-Star Panel. You can do so via our comment system. You can shoot us an email in that comment system or just shoot us an email of questions at theoptionsinsider.com. Of course, you can also find us on Twitter or on Facebook. A lot of places for you guys to reach out to us here on the show and make your voices heard. And, of course, all of us here on the All-Star Panel want to thank all of you in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and making it such a success. And we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. Become a part of the Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The options block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved. of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.